So we are live streaming. My name is Dr. Grace Telesco, and I'm with the Fischler College of Education School of Criminal Justice. We are now on YouTube, and I am joined by my very good friend who we just were talking about that we have been doing this now for a year. It's going to be, it's actually pretty soon going to be a year. Yeah. Like we can't even believe it, but yeah. um, Ed Denzel from Unfound. And for those of you who have been following us and, and following our regular monthly broadcast, because now it is a monthly broadcast, uh, that's definitely what we've been doing. And our next one will be April 22nd. We just solidified that before we went live. And uh, it's just been really exciting. Uh, there's a beautiful collaboration between the show Unfound of course, Ed Denzel, who is the face of Unfound. Um, so it's a really great collaboration that we have here. And um, it's been wonderful. We've been, we've been doing a lot of different, looking at investigating a lot of different cases, listening to the facts. Um, one of the great things that I love about, I love a lot of things about Ed, but one of the things I really love about uh, him and the way he contextualizes everything is that it's just the facts, just the facts without a lot of theory, without a lot of spin, without a lot of, uh, you know, con conjecture or putting, putting anything in there, uh, opinion based. And the other really great thing about Ed's work is that he really gives voice to those who are missing. He gives voice to the families. He gives voice to those, uh, to those individuals who remain unfound. And so Ed, with no further ado, tonight we have a very, very interesting case. Um, while the, the missing person case itself is old, there's new, very new uh, information and developments. So right. without any further ado, Ed Denzel mm -hmm. from Unfound. Uh, Dr. Telesco, it's good to uh, be with you again. Uh, I was joking around. Yes, it's always been a year. It'll be April. It'll be a year since uh, uh, we were introduced uh, with the help of my uh, assistant, Natasha. I cannot thank her enough. And in fact, I made the joke that uh, when we first met, I actually had short hair. That's how long it's been. But um, it's good to be on the program again. And you're right. Uh, the disappearance murder that we now know as a murder, uh, is unique in Unfound's catalog. Uh, this, is what, uh, this was a special episode that was produced in October of 2019, so about a year and a half ago. And I'm going to go through how it all happened, why this is a special episode compared to all of the other episodes that Unfound has done in the last four and a half years. We are now over... Uh, 200 disappearances covered, and we now have almost a total of 240 episodes. I can't even imagine that. I, I can't even imagine back in August of 2016 that uh, the program would be as successful as it is, uh, as, as much listened to as it is, and everybody that is joined on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and everywhere else. Uh, I, I just feel so thankful. I, I tell people I'm one of the luckiest people in the world. Uh, but this case uh, sticks out for its uniqueness in that it was a disappearance and then it became a murder and then Unfound ca ca uh, covered it after that. So it is the disappearance slash murder of Janelle Matthews. She was 12 years old from Greeley, Colorado, and she disappeared originally on December 20th, 1984. And by the way, if you see me looking off to my left, or you're right, I'm looking at my notes. I cannot do a lot of this uh, off the top of my head. And I just want to uh, make the disclaimer that I've never spoken to anybody in Janelle's family, okay? And you will understand why here in a bit because the way we ended up covering this, uh, this case uh, was very, very unique and you'll see why. Um, as I think all of you now know, if you've watched myself with Dr. Telesco before, and even if you listen to the episodes of Unfound, you know I like to work with themes. You know that for me, it's all about education, not only trying to educate the public about missing persons cases, but what can I learn? What can my assistants learn? And how do we apply those lessons to disappearances we've covered in the past 
and disappearances that we will cover in the future. We are all about education. And in fact, I was just talking to somebody within the last couple of days, trying to apply like the scientific method uh, to missing persons cases. If you have a case over here, does this apply to any other disappearances um, that have occurred? And once again, as Dr. Uh, Telesco said, just looking at the facts themselves and seeing if we can relate and learn things by studying different kinds of diff uh, disappearances. So these are my three points to ponder slash lessons to learn uh, missing persons theory concepts uh, for tonight. Number one, was the missing person the crime or unfortunately became part of the crime? And we have some examples from Unfound's catalog of cases that I will eventually uh, mention. Number two, what are we to do about people who infuse themselves into missing persons cases? I will again give some examples of that and probably the best known one over the last 25 years, although we have not covered that case. And number three, are stranger on stranger crimes more common than we believe? These are the three points, uh, lessons that we're going to be thinking about tonight uh, as um, I go through these facts. Now, the facts of uh, the facts of Jolene's disappearance as it occurred in 1984 are fairly straightforward. She's 12 years old. She was at a Christmas concert, and I believe we have a picture of that night where she is in the, the course there at the, must have been maybe elementary school. And uh, there she is right there. That is from the evening that she disappeared. This would have been just hours before she disappeared. And I think this is part of a screenshot uh, of a video that was taken that evening. She was driven home by her friend's father, Russell Ross. And Russell's daughter was also in the concert, uh, the same age. And she was also in the car with Janelle and her father. And Russell Ross will play an important role later, maybe even coincidentally. Janelle gets dropped off. No one was home. Although the garage door, what Russell Ross said, is when he dropped her off, he remembered that the garage door was open on the house, although he did not remember if he knew that nobody was going to be home or not. Her father came home about an hour later, so around, I think, 7 to 8 o'clock, and Janelle wasn't there. She was never seen again. All right. So once again, the facts of this disappearance are fairly straightforward. They are not in dispute. It was investigated. No signs of, of violence inside the house. No signs of a break in. Nothing. And in fact, we have a, a disappearance in, uh, that we've covered on and found that is very similar that I will go through in a little bit. But then, so this case at least from the investigation side, no clues really pop up at all for 35 years. So 1984, then in 2019, there was uh, some ground being dug up outside of Greeley, Colorado, I believe to the south of town uh, for a gas line, oil line, something like that. So it's a crew out there in this field, just digging this line along uh, and they come across some remains, the that were buried in this field, not um, near a river, not in a forest or anything like that, just right out in this field. Uh, remains there, obviously, of uh, a young person, unknown if it was a boy or a girl, and the remains were tested. DNA was done. Testing was done. And it was discovered that this was Janelle Matthews. And it is believed uh, that her remains had been there for 35 years. And so, of course, this all started up uh, an additional investigation. Now it was not a missing persons case anymore. It was now a murder investigation. So, Ed, just to kind of clarify, what was the year when the remains were found? 2019, just two years ago, almost exactly two years ago. We're coming up on the two year anniversary. Which is the reason why we kind of said it's an old case, but a new case. That's right. So this disappearance happened in 1984, just as we cover most of the time or all the time on Unfound. And I can tell you that um, we could have covered this uh, case as a disappearance, as a regular disappearance in 2016, 2017, 2018, uh, because it is a disappearance. But then in 2019, when her remains are dug up pretty much by accident, 
just luck that they came across her remains. It then became a murder investigation. There was something that on the remains, the skeleton that let investigators know that this young person who they found out to be Janelle was murdered somehow. Okay. Although I'm not sure it's, it's been put out there exactly how. So I will tell you though, some points that are still unknown to me in knowing about this case for almost two years now. We don't know exactly how often Janelle was home by herself. Did Janelle herself know she would be home alone that evening when getting dropped off? Who else could have known that she would, would be home by herself? Uh, were there any signs of a break-in? There's never been anything announced like that. So usually they do say something like that. That's never been said. So I'm taking for granted that there were no signs of break-in and there were surely no signs of violence in the house. Although I have heard that there were footprints. Uh, this is Colorado. It is December. And so there was probably uh, snow on the ground and footprints uh, were around uh, the house. Although I don't think that they could ever be attached to anyone because they were in snow and not in mud or something like that. So what then happens, so this happens, and I can tell you at the time when this all happened in 2019, when her, when her remains were discovered, it was not even on my radar. Uh, I maybe read a news story about it, um, but uh, I, I, everybody knows, my assistants especially, that when I'm working on Unfounds cases, I really don't pay attention to a lot of other things going on out there. That's just the way I am. I'm very concentrating. I'm just keeping my eye on my own work. Well, what happened was in August of 2019, a guy named Steve uh, became a Patreon supporter, uh, patreon.com forward slash unfound podcast. He became a Patreon supporter of the program. Just like any other person then or now who supports the program monetarily on a monthly basis. And later, though, he emailed me, he contacted me, and he revealed that if I, I think it was the, you know, he asked me about Janelle Matthews, uh, you know, the remains being found. And then he eventually revealed his last name and said, I'm the guy that they suspect <clears throat> who murdered Janelle back in 1984. And I would like to come on your program to talk about it and how I'm being railroaded, how I didn't do it, how I believe the Greeley Police Department is after me, on and on and on. Okay, so I ended up looking him up. Uh, I would find out later, not at the time, but even after I interviewed him for the program, that he had done this to other programs like Unfound. He, uh, in August of 2019, he monetarily, through Patreon or PayPal, contributed to other programs, I think wanting, trying to get attention to himself so he could be on those programs to talk about, just like I said, how the police have been after him for all these years for something that he didn't do. It ends up that I was one, I guess, was one of the few, if not, if maybe the only one who took him up on this offer to come on the program. But I have to tell you, um, it was not an easy decision for me. And, uh, you know, I'm looking, I'm going to scroll down my notes here just a little bit. And, and I finally decided to do it. I talked this over with my assistants. And the reason was that uh, Unfound follows a very specific uh, formula to covering cases. We talk to mostly family members. And then sometimes I have a couple of true crime bloggers on who I believe do great work. That's what I do. Those are the people who I interview. And so when you go to the other side of it, somebody who's a suspect, I have to start thinking, you know, what are families going to think about this? Me giving a voice to the other side. Somebody who's going to come on here and say, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Not, on, not only on top of that, it wasn't a disappearance anymore. It was a murder. And I don't cover murders where there are remains or bodies left behind. We are a missing persons program. So I talked this over with my assistants who I, I, I trust. Uh, they've become very good friends of mine. And if I may name them, Emily, Cherie, Carrie, Heather, Eric, and Natasha. And uh, although I don't think Natasha was with us at the time, um, they said, you know what, you, you need to do this. And so at that point, I just became a regular reporter. Uh, I was not a specialist in missing persons anymore. 
I became just the guy who's going to talk to this person who wants to get his um, his story out there. And he had done interviews in the past, but I said, okay, I'm going to do this. So what I said to Steve was this, okay, I'll interview you, but I get to ask any question that I want. And at if any point during this interview, now it wasn't live, it was recorded at any time that you say, well, I'm not going to answer that. The interview is over. All right. Cause I have other people to talk to. I have a program. I have families to talk to about their missing persons cases. So if you're going to ask me to do this, then we have to do this my way. Right. All right. So we'll do it. So then and that brought you, that probably brought you back to your journalist days. Yeah, well, yeah, well, I guess I don't know how many journalist days I have, but I have interview experience. If there was ever a person in the true crime community, I think who could interview him, it would be me because I do interviews every week. And okay? is this the first, was this the first time that someone who was a possible suspect had reached out to you? Uh, in this way, yes. I will tell you that I even have it written down that a couple of cases I ended up speaking to a suspect. After the fact, uh, with the disappearance of Judith Emke, which is a disappearance from Tennessee, I think also going back to the 80s, he contact, I contacted him after the fact. Uh, we tracked him down, and uh, he was willing to talk to me, but it was after the episode came out. And also in the disappearances of Jansen Brewer and Daniel Braden, after the fact, after the episode came out, a guy who was mentioned as a suspect in that episode got all ticked off, said he wanted to talk to me. And we had a conversation over Messenger, and eventually the, the the DA in that county where those two young men disappeared found out that I interviewed this guy and wanted a copy of the conversation, which I, of course, sent them. And that would have been sometime in the summer of 2019 that that happened. So I've done this, but usually after the fact, after episodes have already come out, and then I let the listeners know uh, and the, the, these conversations are not necessarily recorded, although through messenger or whatever, uh, but never in an official capacity like this. OK, never. And I have not done anything like this, although I'm not ruling it out. So I got to ask Steve any uh, questions that he wanted. Uh, if he refused to answer any questions, the interview would be over and it would be like it never existed. He agreed. We did the interview and the interview is over three hours the episode itself is over four hours, one of the longest in Unfound's history, and it came out on November 4th, 2019. Um, I'm not going to say that I believe he told the entire truth or lied the entire time. That is always up for the listeners and the audience to decide. I just try to ask the toughest questions uh, that I can, and that is the situation with families or anybody else who was on the program. It's up to the audience to determine what they think. Uh, given what the answers are. And you should know in uh, the sum of the parts was that he totally denies uh, killing Jan Janelle and he had nothing to do with her murder. Okay. So this is how this all happened. Now I'm going to go just through some of the, uh, the details of that interview. All right. Uh, but if you want to listen to the entire thing and you have four hours on your hand, uh, some time on your hands, then you should go listen to that. And I would urge you to do that. You can find this episode on Podomatic, Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher, all the popular podcasting platforms. And it came out November 4th, 2019. First of all, you have to understand that Steve Pankey is a strange guy. Whether he killed Janelle or not, he is a weird cat. Um, I've only ever talked to him once on the phone, and that was for the interview. I've not talked to him on the phone since, although he did send me some emails back and forth. We emailed back and forth after that, but I don't think that that's happened since maybe early 2020. The only time I spoke to him live on the phone was uh, during that interview that now everybody can hear. He is a guy who ran for office in the state of Idaho. He's done other interviews in the past regarding Janelle Matthews. Um, disappearance at the time and now we know murder and he loves to talk he loves to uh, talk about himself he loves to talk about everything that went on at that time he let he'll just reveal everything about his life if you let him and he does in some in other interviews but for the purposes of the interview uh that i did we really 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 tried to just stick 
to Janelle Matthews, but he'll happily tell you about when he's a young man and all sorts of stuff that have nothing to do with her case at all. He's just different. But here's his story. He says on the day before and the day of December 20th, 1984, he was preparing to go on a trip with his wife and children, in, uh, and he did live in Greeley, Colorado. He did, says he did not hear about Janelle's disappearance until the trip was over, possibly on the way home, like on the radio, possibly. The very next day after he got back, so we're now talking somewhere around Christmas of uh, 1984. He claims, this is what the story he told, that he was at home and his father-in-law, who didn't live too far away, so his wife's father, uh, who didn't live too far away, they did not have much, uh, Steve did not have a much of a relationship with him. He claims that his father-in-law came over as Steve was unpacking the car after this trip. Wife's inside, children is in, are inside. And the father-in-law says, uh, somebody has asked me to bury a body for them. And the next words out of the father-in-law's mouth was, and it doesn't look good for you, Steve. That's what he said. And he, the this father-in-law inferred that he got the feeling that police were going to try to, to pin whoever's body this is, Janelle Matthews's, Name never came up in this conversation, Steve claims. But the father-in-law tried to portray it as if the police and other people in that community were going to try to pin this body that he was going to bury. So father-in-law becomes part of the crime, I guess. They were going to try to pin the um, this death, this murder on Steve. This is Steve's story. Once again, it's up to you to determine... Uh, why that is and, and why we'll get to that. So at no time was Janelle Matthews mentioned in this conversation, but it was just days after she had gone missing. Uh, Steve uh, told me in the interview that he did not tell his wife about this at all. Uh, and the topic never came up with his father-in-law again. And Steve says, I have no idea at all. You know what went on? I didn't want to ask. Uh, or anything else. However, once it became 1985, so let's say a week later, 10 days later, Steve said that he finally decided, you know what, I got to go to the police with this. So he went to the police and told them about the father-in-law's story. And Steve will claim that from that moment, because he says he was doing a civic duty and saying what the father-in-law said, that Steve himself then became the number one suspect in what now was known to be Janelle Matthews's disappearance. And Steve claims since then they have been trying to pin her disappearance and now murder on him. This is what he claims. Um, and over the years, yes, they, they've tried to pin it on him. And they've served, served warrants on him at the time. They found nothing. Uh, they interrogated him. They, you know, they tried to harass him and everything and trying to admit that he caused her disappearance and that he murdered her. And he said, I didn't do it. And that is what he's been saying since 1984. But and this goes back to something, one of the points I brought up. It's one of those things. Is Steve a suspect because he infused himself into the disappearance by showing up there and telling them what his father-in-law allegedly said? Or is he a suspect because there might have been proof that he did something to Janelle and he's lying this about this story regarding the father-in-law, but they just didn't have enough on him because, of course, Janelle's remains uh, were missing uh, for 35 years. So Steve says he had nothing to do with Janelle's death. Did not know her family, did not know her, did not even live close to where the where the Matthews lived. Uh, what I think he said he lived at least a mile and a half away. I know that doesn't sound very far, but it's in a, a town slash city. So there are a lot of people who, of course, live closer to the Matthews than Steve Pankey did. Now, what Steve says, and he the reason he believes that uh, they've come after him 
uh, and have done so over all of these years. And it, and it's this, and it's a little bit convoluted, but just hang with me for a moment. Steve theory, uh, Steve's theory. Well, remember Russell Ross? I told you to remember him. Well, he was the guy who drove Janelle home that evening, and his daughter was also there. Well, coincidentally, Russell Ross and Steve Pankey used to work together at a 7-Up bottling plant in Greeley, Colorado in the early 80s. And that Steve says that Russell Ross and these others didn't like him because at some point Steve filed uh, a lawsuit against the company. Um, harassment or they were doing things wrong, something like a whistleblower, something like that. And because of that, Russell and all of these other people at this plant got ticked off at him. In addition, the current 2021, I think he's still the mayor, uh, at least he was in 2019, the current mayor of Greeley, Colorado, whose name is John Gates, was a police officer in Greeley, Colorado at the time of Janelle's disappearance. And coincidentally, his family owned that bottling company. Now, you should know I got to speak to Russell Ross on the phone, and I also had an email exchange with John Gates, and I will tell you about that uh, here in a moment. So it's uh, uh, because just to make sure, being that when, once the interview was done and I knew that he mentioned these names, I thought, you know what, I'm going to contact these people and see if they want to talk. Russell Ross did talk to me on the phone, and like I said, John Gates, uh, even though he's the mayor of Greeley, Colorado, he did get back to me and offered me a statement. And I'll tell you once again what both said. Uh, so in Steve's mind, these people were trying to pin Janelle's murder on him because he was a whistleblower or whatever he was regarding this law lawsuit at this plant a few years before that. This is how this is his thinking. I spoke to Russell Ross. Here's what he says. This is what Russell Ross told me. Uh, this uh, phone call was not recorded. Uh, I just uh, took some notes as he was talking. He says he barely remembers Steve Pankey. In fact, he says that he and Steve did not even work in the um, same parts of the plant. I uh, no time uh, after Janelle and, and Russell Ross says he had a lot of guilt about dropping Janelle off and then her going missing. He has a lot of guilt that he says he still has because in addition, her, his daughter and Janelle were friends. At no time in the past 35 years did he ever suspect that ever even know that Steve was a suspect in Janelle's disappearance. He said he never heard that, and he still lives there in Greeley. Uh, he had never heard anything about con uh, concerning Steve being connected to Janelle. At no time did he have any contact with Steve after Steve left the company. I think Steve left first, and Russell uh, continued to work there. And, at, and I even asked them this, being that it does seem like this weird coincidence, if we were to suspect Steve, what are the odds that his former coworker dro drops Janelle off and then Steve is there to go to her house and get her somehow? I even asked Russell, did you ever get the idea at any point that Steve Pankey was following you, kind of stalking you, keeping an eye on you, keeping an eye on you, keeping an eye on your family, keeping an eye on your daughter. He goes, no, I, I just, no, I, not, never. So that is something that still has to be worked out uh, regarding uh, this case. So I also got to speak to John. I didn't get to speak to him. It was an email exchange. I had an email exchange with John Gates, the, uh, who I believe is still the current mayor of Greeley, Colorado. Um, he called, I, I told him that I'd done this interview and it was going to be coming out and his name came out and would he like to comment? He, John says, and remember he was a, a police officer in 1984 when this happened and his family owned that bottling company. He called everything that Steve said about Janelle's, uh, disappearance slash murder over the years, ramblings, that's in quotes, ramblings. In addition what John says is that he says his family did own the bottling company, the seven up bottling company in Greeley, but they had sold it a few years before he believes Steve ever worked there. This is John Gates. I've not looked into that. 
it, I, I'm guessing that if he's going to say it must be true, because that would be something that you probably could go back into the paperwork. But I will admit um, that I have not done that. I will admit it. But so that was enough for him to say that, that, OK, so the, the John Gase's family didn't own the bottling company when this lawsuit, whatever Steve did in the early 80s. And you should know the way I, I remember it. Russell Ross uh, didn't even remember anything about this lawsuit, but I think it did happen. So now we have to figure out if Steve is the culprit, if he's the perpetrator, if he is the murderer, what connections could there be between Steve and Janelle? Uh, of course, remember, his alibi is that he was preparing to go on this trip, a trip that his family went on. Well, he was a member of the church where Janelle's family went to church. And in fact, I think he wasn't just a member there. I think at one point he was kind of like higher up in the church. I don't know if he was like the leader or the pastor or the priest or anything like that, but he was an elder or something like that in this church. He just, I don't think was just a regular, uh, I think he might've taught Bible classes or something like that. However, Steve and his family uh, did not live near Janelle's family. Uh, but Steve, uh, as he will gladly tell you if you ask, um, Steve did have uh, felonies in the 70s, in the 80s. Okay, so uh, he did have a criminal record uh, for a variety of things, um, but um, I don't know if anything along the lines of you know kidnapping a 12-year-old girl. So, um, however... If police had anything to do, uh, you know, we have to think of it this way. If police had anything on him from the crime scene in Uh, um, and there's a picture right there of Steve. I think when he was campaigning to, uh, for a political position in Idaho, there he is, there's Steve again. Uh, and then there's Steve after he got charged with Janelle's murder in, um, you know, orange is the new black, I guess. And, um, when they came out and did this press conference, the DA and the prosecutor did not offer up one reason other than they've just suspected him all along to charge him with Janelle's murder. They did not offer up any evidence in my mind, you know, even hints of it that uh, Steve was the, uh, was the killer of Janelle. Whereas I can tell you in other disappearances that we've covered when finally a suspect was named and charged that the police usually do do that. So it was quite a contrast compared to what, what they did in Greeley and the experience I have with other cases that have kind of gone down this road when remains have been found. So to connect Steve to her murder, how did he end up on Janelle Street on that evening? How did he know she would be home alone? And is it a coincidence that Steve's former co-worker at the Seven Up bottling plant was the one who drove Janelle home. So this brings us the whole way back to our points uh, that I brought up uh, before I started all of this, uh, talking for the last 25 minutes. Was Jan So once again, number one, was Janelle the crime or did she become the crime? Meaning, did somebody go to that house looking to attack her, kidnap her and kill her? Or was it a situation where maybe she got dropped off and there was already somebody in the house trying to rob it because it was empty, because the garage door was open. Or was she there and somebody broke in or came in, saw the garage door open and didn't know that she was there at home already? We have a, uh, a disappearance that we covered from La Crosse, Wisconsin, going way back to the 1950s that is exactly like this. Uh, the disappearance of Evelyn Hartley, who I think was just a few years older. She was babysitting at somebody else's house in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And uh, the parents came home to find 
a lamp knocked over. There was obviously somebody had broken into the house. Evelyn was gone. The baby was unharmed, very, uh, very fortunately. But that's a case that's almost 70 years old, still unsolved. Evelyn, alive or deceased, has never been found. But into this day, nobody seems to know, did this person go into this house looking to rob it and rob it and Evelyn was there? Or was Evelyn the target of this? Nobody knows. No, at least in the public knows. So number two, people who infuse themselves into disappearances. This is probably more common than people think. Um, uh, people who, you know, working at a 7-Eleven, two in the morning, they'll say they saw a missing person. Yeah, this, that uh, young woman who's missing, yeah, I could swear she was here at two in the, in the morning. I swear it's her. Police go to the videotape. N not her. In fact, a lot of times there's not even anybody there. People just making things up to get the attention. And I can tell you, Steve Pankey is that type of person. He loves the attention. He loves to talk about himself, loves it. But he's also, uh, in my opinion, very paranoid. Uh, we had this happen in Suzanne Lyle's uh, disappearance, the very first case that we covered on Unfound, where after she went missing, uh, her, her boyfriend slash ex-boyfriend's father said he was seeing Suzanne everywhere. He'd call the police, say, I saw her today, I saw her today. Well, the police started following him, and they found out that he was just making this stuff up. They were, like, shadowing him, and they would be actually watching him as he was calling the police, saying, yeah, I just saw uh, Susie. He was just making it up. So this happens. And probably the most um, common um, instance of this is John Mark Carr. Who is he? He's the guy who claimed that he killed John Benet Ramsey. What well, turns out he wasn't even in the United States at the time of her murder, coincidentally also in Colorado. Important, and there is no proof that so the most important part, at least to the public over the last 30 some years, is there's no proof that Steve would have ever been a suspect had he not gone to police with the story about his father-in-law in early 1985. To this day, I've never heard anything to the contrary. And then finally, I, I spoke uh, number th third. The third point is stranger on stranger crime. I think we're now because as far as we can tell, Steve and Janelle were strangers. They might have gone to the same church, but nobody's come forward to say, oh, yeah, he taught her by in Bible study. Yes, they, their families knew each other on and on and on. Nobody in the last 30 some years has said that. I'm not saying it's not true. I'm just saying there's no information out there like that yet. Maybe they will. Sh maybe that will come out. But DNA, I think, is showing, though, going back to the 1980s and earlier as these older crimes get solved, is that um, a lot of these cases, maybe there's a higher percentage of stranger on stranger crime than we think. I think that that's showing. And so maybe that could then lead to us believing that somehow Steve ended up how somehow Steve ended up on that street. And did something to Janelle for whatever reason. Um, and most recently, we're covering a case tomorrow on Unfound that is a stranger on stranger disappearance where a young man, Fernando Castro, abducted and surely murdered Pearl Pinson, but her remains have not been found yet. And those two were strangers. So that is, uh, in a nutshell, I know I've gone for a while here, but it's a four-hour episode. I tried to condense it, but that is everything that we've been through on Unfound regarding Janelle Matthews' murder and then my interview with Steve Pankey and everything else that he's done over the years, doing other interviews, et cetera. So, wow. So that's, that's a lot. And uh, I also want to be able to save some time at the end for our students to come on, our yeah. justice students, uh, Josh and Finger and David Troxel uh, later on to come on and um, and maybe ask some questions. But so it's true that he's held he's he's being held on uh, five million dollars bail. Is that correct? That's right. That's right. That's right. All right. So that's that's number one. He's number in jail. Two. Yes. The um, the trial is set for June. Am I right? Uh, I I have to admit that I did not check and see when the trial was going to be, but uh, it could be this year. Uh, of course, that depends on COVID and a lot of other things. A lot of things have gotten pushed right. back, but it right. surely could be this year. Sure. June could so happen. Here, so here's my big question from a, from a criminal justice law enforcement, you know, perspective. 
this having spent 20 years uh, in the NYPD and investigating cases and uh, just knowing about various charges. Well, the police have to have probable cause. And then I'm sure that there was a grand jury indictment. There had to be uh, that that the evidence, whatever the evidence was, was brought to a grand jury for what we call a true bill, right? Mm -hmm. Which means it, it's really just rubber stamping the fact that the police have probable cause. Um, all you need is probable cause to make an arrest. You need beyond a reasonable doubt to convict mm -hmm. and beyond a reasonable doubt means unanimous. Like it means it's, it's not preponderance of the evidence, which you have right. in, a, in a civil case right. it's beyond the reasonable doubt. Beyond, yeah. And then the doubt has to be reasonable. But before we even go there, they have to provide the grand jury with the evidence. And the grand jury comes back and says, yes, the police had probable cause. So my question is, and I don't even know if we have an answer to this, mm. is what evidence do they have? Nobody knows. And that that's well, and, see, this, and I you should know from my standpoint, this is rare because we covered the disappearance of Kamisha Hollis. Um, and her boyfriend, the father of her children, is also going to be going to trial this year. But she is still missing. And I can remember interviewing, was it her sister? Um, and we were going through the evidence during my interview with her official interview for the program. And I can even tell you that I said, you know, if they're going to charge the boyfriend with her, her disappearance and her death, I hope they have more than this. Cause at the time it seemed a little dicey. There were a lot of what I call wiggle room, a lot of wiggle room in there. But you know, well, a month later, the DA, the prosecutor for that did charge him and what happened this guy came out and said yeah we have this these additional evidence that was not covered in the interview because her, her, her the guest did not know it i apply those same standards to steve's and it just it, it's just not the same the da prosecutor came out and didn't said less <laughs> than the information that has been out there all over all these years regarding uh, Janelle Matthews's disappearance and now murder. He did not say anything additional other than, well, we've had him on, uh, on our list for a long time. We suspect that he did this and that's about it. No, that can't be. It's, it's not. Oh, well, it's I know. Not I know that, <laughs> but you know, um, why are they, why just, are they, is, yeah, I guess what I'm asking you is, uh, being that you uh, are the uh, police officer, you have the experience, I do not, is that were they really just waiting 35 years to find a body? They had all this evidence against Dave, but they really wanted to make sure and just waited for the body. That stretches my imagination a little bit um, because we do have cases where people have been brought to trial and convicted without bodies. And if it was so convincing that Steve did it, um, you know, what evidence really could have been on Janelle Matthews's remains when they were recovered in 2019 that could have pointed towards Steve Pankey really 35 years later, DNA would be totally ruined by that point. It would yeah. just not be applicable. So be I don't know. Be, yeah. I don't know. know. There's gotta be something that, um, a judge holds someone on $5 million bail with sketchy evidence. It just something is doesn't compute. Now, what what does sound like it might compute is the fact that the suspect has inserted himself and right. said, hello, look at me, look at me. And then that's right. And, and then that makes them, you know, red flags and then go follow that evidence wherever yes. it leads you. And it may have led in in the direction of, you know, this this is the guy. Right. So I don't know. I mean, it would be really interesting and it will be interesting to see if um, at the trial, if there's any information that we can get and then to kind of do a follow up, it would be really interesting to kind of follow the case. Yeah. As it's coming up. It's, it, yeah. it should be in June. It looks like, and there's going to be some pretrial motions that are going to happen uh, before right. that. But uh, you know, what I would say is that, I guess from my standpoint, you should know that myself and my assistants, we kind of differ on the guilt uh, of Steve Pankey. Um, but 
what I continue to say is outside of him just infusing himself into the case and going to police and having this, what some may say, a crazy story about his father-in-law, there's no, there, there has been never any uh, evidence released that he should be connected to this, her, her death. It's not like they live next door. It's not like there's a video of his car going down her street that evening. You know, there's no, you know, there's never been in any news that there are fingerprints found or anything. Cause surely if fingerprints had been found at her house, for example, that would have been enough. I think in 1984, 85 to charge him, you know, given that she's missing and he shouldn't have been in that area and can't explain why his fingerprints are on her house. That should be enough. Wasn't done. Mm. You know, they they served warrants on him over the years, uh, never charged him with anything. They served warrants on him just before I interviewed him. And he still remained a free man for an additional year after I interviewed him. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Once again, these are some law enforcement legalities in the process that I don't have. I'm not as familiar with as you are. Yeah. Do you know? I mean, uh, it'd be interesting to know if this is going to be a public uh, if public has, has access into the trial, uh, maybe and, it's big. It was national news, especially so, considering that he ran for office in Idaho and everything else. Yeah, certainly it could yeah. be. Yeah. So we'll, uh, we'll want to keep an eye on that. I have a couple of, uh, comments. So from, from some of the viewers and then we'll bring mm-hmm. Josh and David on. Yeah. So this is Alexa Albanese. Uh, Do you think the suspect is so active in other podcasts to distract the police from a larger truth? Well, I don't know what the larger truth uh, would be, but, um, you know, I will tell you that I did not find out, I think, until after I interviewed him that he had, uh, you know, tried to get on other programs and had gone given money through Patreon and, uh, and other, you know, other venues to other programs. In fact, a guy who I really respect within the true crime community, John Lord, and I just did a show with him a couple months ago. Um, John, uh, Steve contacted him. And when, when John found out who he was, John gave his money back. I would admit that I didn't because my attitude was if Steve wants to pay for uh, me uh, to put him in jail, then I'm more than happy enough to take his money if he's a killer. Right. So, I'm more than happy to you know put yeah. that money to a good cause. So uh, that was my attitude. John can do what he wants. I, I did what I want. Right. But uh, I, a larger truth, I, I don't know what that larger truth would be. Okay. But you know, are, is he getting railroaded? Steve believes that. I don't know if how many other people believe that. Yeah. But can you can you speak to uh, this picture? Yeah, this is uh, Janelle's house. This is Janelle's house, and that garage door you say uh, see on the left there. Uh, what Russell Ross said at the time is that 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 garage door was up. I don't know if it was the whole way up. It might have only been halfway up or something. But he said that it was definitely up uh, and open, I guess you'd say, uh, when he dropped Janelle off that uh, that evening. Now, did you say that uh, fingerprints were found? No, I, no. Uh, n- uh, to my knowledge, no fingerprints were oh, found. Okay. That's just that was just an example of if they had Steve's fingerprints I, at the scene, okay. you'd think he would have been charged a long time ago. There okay. were footprints there, but footprints in the snow. I don't know how scientific that would be. I think yeah. if they were footprints in mud or something, right. it'd be a little different. You know, okay. with snow, it can melt. You know, I just don't. Know. What is this picture? This is a picture of her family, you know, and uh, these are other missing persons cases uh, in Colorado, I believe. Uh, And as you could tell, uh, this is, uh, I'm guessing, a photo that's quite a few years old going back uh, to the 1980s. Of course, Janelle is up there in the right hand corner. And Sean Evans, I don't know about these other disappearances, whether whether they are still unsolved or not. But this was one of the press events that her family did uh, back then. Okay. All right. So I'm bringing on our, uh, our two amazing criminal justice seniors who are going to graduate and they're going to graduate in May. It's a few more months before I have to say goodbye to them. And, um, it's heartbreaking, you know, like you talk you have to about kick them out of the more. nest, right? Yeah. You have to kick them out you, of the nest. You talk about your assistance and these two are, uh, very near and dear to my heart. And so, um, anyway, I'm going to give them the opportunity to talk to you and ask mm-hmm. maybe some questions about the case. This case is, to me, they're all important and they're all so fascinating. This one in particular is 
one that we want, we really want to, I think we want to like go and tune in again and maybe, maybe have like a, another show, mm, you know, on, sure. on Janelle, maybe yeah. uh, in July or August. If seeing, the trial happens seeing then, yeah. what information might come from the case, from the trial, sure. if it goes sure. to trial, he pled not guilty, yeah. but um, you know, and I'm sure yep. we'll see what yeah. happens. Well, if I could just say something about that $5 million uh, bond or bail, whatever it is, I can tell you that, that of course, my listeners have been following that. And they were surprised that he got bail at all. They were surprised he just wasn't remanded. I mean, he's being charged with murder, and he's tried to get away with, with it for 35 years, and he lives in another state, on and on and on. They were even surprised that there was any bail at all. They were surprised that he just didn't get put in jail, and he's just going to have to wait until the trial happens. Mm. That was their impression. Yeah. All right. So, uh, David, pass it to you. Sure. Hi, Ed. Good evening. Uh, always a pleasure. Good to see you. Um, you know, uh, some things stand out to me right away in this case. Um, now, of course, I don't have anything factual information. This is all strictly opinionated. Um, but one, like you had mentioned, um, there could be several copycat individuals who may be suffering from some sort of mental disorders, which often happens when they try to co they try to um, take the blame for a crime that they yeah. did not commit. That yeah. you've already mentioned. That obviously stands out, and we've seen that time and time again. Yeah. Um, as far as the case details, it I think the only thing that saved him in the beginning was the fact that his daughter was riding home with him when he dropped this this poor child off. Um, Russell Ross, you're talking about right. Russell Ross is the one who dropped them. Yeah. And it was a former coworker of Steve's. Yes. Right. And was it Steve that was the one who's in jail now? Steve is the one now? that's been charged with the murder. And Russell Ross was his former coworker who dropped Janelle right. off that evening. Yeah. It's just something doesn't sit right with me. One, uh, obviously, you don't know if the garage door is open or not. That's what you know, Russell said. We can only go by. He was the exactly. one that was there. Exactly. You know? We only have uh, a one-sided story from one individual who can clearly say anything um, to take the attention away from himself. But the details of the case seem a little bit strange to me. Um, and as far as the evidence, in my opinion, in cases that I've studied in the past, I don't see that a judge, especially on a 35-year-old case, would remand somebody on $5 million bond if they didn't have significant evidence against this individual i agree with you i I'll, on the other hand i just wonder if there was so much pressure being that this is so high profile it's 35 right. years old it's a little girl it's steve panky who kind of is a weird guy anyway and is that just what they said well he's so weird he had to have done it you know look what he's done look what he said and, and all these things well, you luckily, know, we live in a country that, you know, you don't you, you can't be charged with a crime just because you're weird. I, I know that. I know I that. Just, but, yeah. Thank God sure. for that. Yeah, right. right. That's yeah. right. But uh, just, we're all just human, you know, yeah, and, I just think uh, there, there might have been some public pressure here yeah. uh, right. to get this all solved. And uh, we have to remember that the mayor uh, of the town is was a cop at the time in 1984 when this happened and that he mm -hmm. might have, you know, there might've been some political pressure there too. Maybe, maybe we'll see. it would have just been really nice to see some sort of DNA evidence come about, but it's highly unlikely. If they um, have it, I've not heard about it. And I got to believe, I can't believe there would be anything meaningful on the remains of, of, of bones that have been out buried for 35 years. Yeah. It'll be interesting. Yeah, so, it certainly will. Yeah. Josh, what's your take on this? It's actually really funny because one point that I do want to bring up is um, I don't have a lot of like, um, you know, personal details. But one thing I did is I used to job shadow back home when I first was in high school. And I really enjoyed being able to like go out in the field with everybody. And what happened one day is that due to like new DNA evidence. So I kind of want to stay hopeful just with this part of the comment is that they were going through an old, it was like about an eighties case as well, where like a mafia had shot somebody through a car. And what had happened wow. is they had actually found a cigarette, but due to like new DNA evidence, like somewhere lodged in a seat or somewhere. So um, I just think it's really interesting from y'all kind of stating those points that it's always like stay hopeful with these old cases. Uh, you never know what kind of evidence, especially with kind of how you've talked about these missing person cases is you just never know 
what's going to pop up. It, nope. It's always you a day by day hopeful. And I think you even said it last show, the best part about a hidden person's case, missing person's case is luck. Mm-hmm. You know. Yeah, unfortunately, yep. a lot of them are solved that way. And as I yeah. stated, uh, if they not have been, if they had not been digging out there, putting this pipe in or whatever, mm-hmm. her remains would still be out there. And not only that, but I definitely kind of had some questions just because I, uh, I was really glad David kind of answered more so about the personal aspects of the case that got rid of like half the stuff I kind of like typed up throughout the show. To, uh, but I will say, just due to like recent classes as well as like this whole interview is what's got my mind so boggled. Uh, with him kind of like trying to talk to you uh, just due to like a recent class of like interview techniques throughout that podcast which of course I'll probably go back and watch would you say that you noticed any possible strong like basic kinesis like principles of you know like the nervousness or like was did and you said he's a weird guy so he just uh, straight on and he just looked like the camera straight in the eyes and just like you even said weird well I don't get I don't get to see him I only get to listen to him Gotcha. And to mine, the way I remember it of the interview is that he told he told a strange story regarding his father in law. And there's other details that I didn't have time to go into for this hour. Um, But there were no contradictions in his story. Okay, I mean, granted, if he killed her, he's had 35 years to get his story straight. (laughs) And he's probably sat down and looked at all the ins and outs and make sure that it somehow it all makes sense. All I can do is ask the toughest questions that I can. It's up to the listeners to decide if he's telling the truth or not. But in my opinion, he told no contradictions. That doesn't mean he he told the truth. So, Ed, I have another question that is more general, uh, not Mm -hmm. to do with this case, but more to do with your work. Mm -hmm. And so, like in this case where, you know, we're mentioning we're mentioning people's names because it's part of the facts of the case. Do you ever worry about any kind of defamation of character, lawsuits or anything, anything in that arena from a civil, pers- you know, civil lawsuit mm-hmm. and civil law perspective? What mm-hmm. have, have uh, you I could say that in uh, your, in your uh, years of doing this? Sure. Uh, four and a half years. I can tell you that I do have uh, I did uh, in 2019. It had nothing to do with Steve's case, though. I did go to an attorney in late 2019 and spoke to him. I I paid for an hour of his time uh, to talk about the program, to talk about what I do. He listened to the program and, and, and everything else. Uh, He told me that from what he's heard that I'm on firm legal ground as to what I'm doing. And this is one of the reasons though, that we do not theorize on the program. We never say, well, if John Smith killed Jane Doe, then how did he do it? We don't do those types of things. All we do is say John Smith was the last one to see Jane Doe. And right. this is what happened afterwards. That's just a fact. I can't, you know, as I've stated, I can't help it sometimes if some of the facts sometimes make people look guilty. I can't help that. Yes. But the, the, the truth, as the attorney stated, is always the number one defense against defamation. And right. so the listeners don't lie. I don't lie. Right. But I've gotten some threats, so I'm going to go to get a lawyer and this and that. And I said, well, I guess I'll just see you in court then. Yeah. You know, we'll just have to hash it out. But, um, you know, a lot of times the names are out here, but I totally leave it up to the guests whether they want to say names or not. I can't control what they say. So sometimes they want to use fake names or just first names or no names or, or whatever else. Most of them don't mind using uh, the full names. And a lot of times most of those names are already out in the public anyway. Right. Have you been in touch with the family? I've not. Uh, I've not. Uh, they whoops, excuse me. Uh, they did not uh, contact me after it. Uh, however, uh, all I can say is that I have been in contact with somebody who knows Steve. But this person, uh, until the trial was over and everything else, um, is not going to interview me about the case or anything until it's over. But somebody who has known Steve for a while, this person, um, you know, knows him, but uh, due to everything that's gone on, uh, we're going to wait to do uh, a talk, have a deep talk, or maybe we'll, maybe we'll do an official interview. I don't know uh, until after this is all over. So we we're not in touch with the family. No, not, not at this time. I'd love to talk to them. Uh, It's not that I've ignored them or anything. They haven't contacted me. Uh, I did not get any flack from them or anybody who knows them regarding my interview with Steve. Um, 
And I, I'm going to just take for granted that that means that they know about it and they thought I did the best job that I could and did not glamorize him in any way that I tried to ask him the best questions that I could and had something come out of it, then it very well may be that there may be something that he said during the interview with me that contradicts what he told police. And maybe that's what brought about him being charged. I don't know. You know, well, I'm, I'm, you record, know, right. I mean, yeah, so, right. You know, we're, we're like right now we're live streaming on YouTube, which right. is public, a public forum. And right. so, you know, anything you can, anything you say can, and we'll be held against you. That's right. Kind of thing. Right. So, and uh, be careful if, what we, what we say right now, but right. I mean, if, if anybody's watching, if, if anyone uh, gets a hold of this YouTube live uh, program, particularly the family of uh of Janelle we we want to really just you know sure. remind our viewers and remind everyone that that these are real cases and that these are real people mm -hmm. and that these are real families that grieve and have unanswered questions and if you know we're we're toying with this uh as sort of a criminal justice experiment if you will you know talking about the facts and and looking at the law and and kind of not theorizing, but just examining it, examining the case, yeah. but it's a real case, you know, and it, yeah. and it hurts deep, right? So like, even like with COVID, we talk about, you know, all of the, the people who have died uh, and, and, and it's a number, you know, when you see it on the screen, on the mm -hmm. news and it's a number, but those numbers represent real people. And those real people rep are, are part of families. And so in this way, we, you know, we, our hearts go out to Jonelle's family. Um, such a, such a tragic loss of a 12 year old girl whose life was completely cut short. And there's a lot of unanswered questions for them. And uh, a lot of, a lot of comp what we call in psychology, complicated grief. And the reason it's complicated is because first it she was missing and it was a disappearance. And then it was like, you know, maybe there was some hope. But then when when her remains were found, right. then it was like the the disappearance happens all over again. Yep. The trauma happens all over again, you know, re-traumatization for the families. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, and some people might say, oh, well, you know, now they have they have closure. But, you know, no. that's something that we we try to stay away from that word yeah. yep. because there is no closure. Um, mm. You don't resolve this, even even if this goes to trial and it is going to trial and uh, is found guilty or not guilty or whatever the outcome is going to be. It still remains a broken heart for the yeah. family. Sure. Right. And that's why we really love what you do, Ed, because you give voice to the families and you give voice to these victims who mm -hmm. have um, who have not been found. Yeah. You know, my impression, I really don't know. I, I've not seen a lot. I don't know how many interviews the Matthews family has done over the last 30 some years. Um, I, I don't know how much they've been in the public. Uh, I certainly would not decline to talk to them and everything, but my impression is that uh, for the most part, uh, they've kind of stayed out of the media. And uh, of course, on top of everything else, when a disappearance gets to be 35 years old, the odds of remains being found 35 years later are so remote. Now it happened. It, of course, we know it happened. Right. And um, so at some point, I, I, it's true. I'm not saying I'm not putting this on the Matthews, but I, I do know that a lot of families just give up, you know, and they, they just, you know, move on and they say, well, if our loved one's going to be found then it's going to happen, but we have, you know, right. lives to leave. We, you know, it's right. affected us emotionally and everything. But yes. the reason you don't sometimes see some families in the news talking about their missing loved one is because it hurts and because they think, you know, it's maybe just time to move on. And yeah. And then happens. you also see a lot of uh, a lot of families get involved in advocacy work. Sure, and that's um, that's another direction that many people go. Absolutely, we see some families who have become devastated by this uh, and uh, divorce, resulting yeah. in divorce, uh, resulting in alcohol or drug addiction. Um, so a whole host of psychological outcomes that are deleterious, that are not that are negative, that are not good, happen as a result of this traumatic event.
that right. that has kind of fractured a f the family. Yeah. So we thank you again for always, you know, bringing these these important cases to light and talking about things that even though they're so long, they're so old. I mean, look in this case. Now yeah. it's not so old anymore. It's old, nope. but it's it isn't. Fr old. It's front and center, and it's going to even front be more front and center come this summer. I guess if that's when the trial is going to occur. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. So Ed, we really uh, we we thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedule. I and love it. Committing love to, to this collaboration monthly. Yeah. Um, our Great. next our next uh, unfound program will be on April twenty second. It's a Thursday at seven mm -hmm. o'clock. We have okay. yet to talk about what case we will look at and examine. Okay. But okay. Ed, did you want to did you want to talk about how the viewers? Most of these viewers are probably. Your well, not, yeah, they're very anyway. yeah, some of them are very faithful and I, I love every I one of them. So, so yes. If you want to let let our yeah. viewers know on YouTube because you know this gets archived mm -hmm. on our Facebook page so that people mm -hmm. could see it if they had missed it live. Um, but let let our viewers know how they can uh, see more of your shows. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the unfound episodes come out on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, Podomatic and a whole, whole host of other podcast platforms, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern every Friday. Sometimes they come out a little earlier, depending on what I have going on that day, but I usually let people know. But you can find Unfound on Facebook. We have a huge discussion group with about 8,000 members on it. We have the Unfound page, which I think has over 8,000 or something like that likes. Uh, I'm on uh, Twitter. I'm on Twitter every day uh, with posting articles and, and links. Uh, Instagram, where I post pictures of the missing people that we are going to feature or have featured on the program. There is the website. Uh, my my assistant, Tasha, does a fantastic job there. I think it's one of the best true crime websites out there for a podcast. Theunfoundpodcast.com. A, a whole host of links and materials and videos and things on that site. If you'd like to contact me, uh, it's uh, my email is the... Uh, is unfoundpodcast at gmail.com. We have a very popular uh, YouTube channel with almost 12,000 subscribers where I do a live show on Wednesday nights. All of the audio episodes eventually get loaded up there. Uh, I do map supplements for some of the, uh, for some of the um, podcasts that are just audio. It's a very, very popular um, YouTube channel. I take great pride in it. Natasha does a great job along with some of the other assistants putting that all together. Uh, as well. Yes. That's what yeah. we do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And speaking of YouTube channels, um, for everyone who's viewing now, if you haven't subscribed to the Fishler College of Education School of Criminal Justice YouTube please do, channel, yes. please do. And then hit the bell for notifications for when we go live. We have an Ed, I really want to uh, put a plug out here for this. Um, April 12th, April 12th, we have Dr. Catherine Ramsland who is going to be our guest uh, and is a webinar. And I want to, I'm going to share the link with you so that you can invite your folks to the okay. webinar. Yes. Uh, then they get an opportunity. It's also going to be live streamed on YouTube, but being a part of the webinar will give your viewers and your followers the ability to actually interact with Dr. Ramslin if they're interested. Um, mm. Her, her show is going to be on Confessions of a Serial Killer. She interviewed wow. the BTK killer. Um, wow. So she's she's a forensic psychologist. Wow. She's world-renowned uh, author of 60, over 60 books on forensics. And uh, as I said- Dennis Rader, right? BTK, Dennis Rader. Yep. And so yeah. she's, she's going to be on April 12th. Mark your calendars okay. uh, for that. And um, I'm going to send you the link so that you, know, hey. you can- you can I'm sure they will be very interested in that. I I'm think sure. they like that. Yeah. So uh, anyway, thank you again. I'm going to let me remove my spotlight so we could show Ed one more time. Huh. And uh, Ed, thank you again. Thank yeah, you, Josh. Thank you, David. Um, thank you, Jessica Rodriguez, who is our behind the scenes um, marketing person who's uh, always does a lot, a lot of work to get us to where we're at. And I appreciate her. I appreciate our dean, Dean Dean Durham. Uh, Dean 
Tammy Kushner, Dr. Kushner, and Dr. Marcelo Castro. You know, uh, for those of you also, the, your followers who might be interested in a little bit more uh, educational perspective on all of this in our criminal justice programs, we've got the undergrad program, we've got the master's, and we've got the PhD. I put the links all in there. Uh, it's on the YouTube uh, chat. So if they're interested, or oh, they could always contact me. And mm -hmm. if they want to contact me, GT243 at Nova.